and welcome to South to North, bringing you the voices of the global South from Johannesburg. A missing bride, a gory corpse on the wrong side of town, and of course, a murder investigation. It could be the plot of a good old-fashioned English crime thriller. Only this one is set in Mumbai and written by a Malaysian. Armed with imagination and modern technology, writers from across the globe are starting to claim their piece of the lucrative crime fiction market. Though often snubbed by Western book critics, the global popularity of the novels shows that readers feel differently. So in what ways do the new books break with previous literary traditions? And what do they have to offer besides a good thrill? In the studio, I have with me Kenyan crime writer and poet Mukoma Wanguki and Malaysian lawyer turned crime author Shamini Flint. And joining us from Cape Town, world-renowned Scottish crime writer Ian Rankin. Welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Let's start with you, Ian. Is the crime fiction scene growing? Is it widening and why? Yes, I think it is. Um, in part because authors, young authors, authors beginning their writing career are attracted to crime fiction in a way that maybe wasn't true in the past because they find things in the crime thriller that they don't necessarily get maybe from the literary novel. You get a great sense of place, you get a sense of big questions, big moral questions, you can talk about corruption in high and low places, politics, the economy, Nothing is off limits to the crime novel. Mm -hmm. When you first started writing crime fiction, I mean, it wasn't popular in Scotland. It's almost as if you were breaking with tradition. Is that how you see it? I think when people thought of crime fiction in Britain, they still tended to think of Agatha Christie. They tended to think of spinsters and titled gentlemen or Belgian detectives solving strange crimes involving unusual poisons and billiard rooms and stately homes and things happening in the vicarage that we weren't supposed to know about. And it seemed that was a very pastoral, curious version of England and Englishness. But what happened was that in the late 20th century, writers began to write a more urbanized crime fiction that did deal with social issues, that did deal with politics. And I think that was where I was coming from. I was coming from a tradition of writing dark, gothic tales, but then marrying that to a concern with modern urban society. Mm -hmm. And marrying that with modern uh, society, it wasn't popular initially. What did you do when times were tough? I was lucky in the early days. My wife had a job, <laughs> so she would be the breadwinner. She would bring home most of the money. And we just, we lived very frugally. We lived on not very much money. Um, we were quite self-sufficient. We had a garden and we would grow vegetables and we wouldn't buy expensive products. So we could get by with not very much money while I wrote and tried to build my reputation. Mm, so a writer has to think of all of that, including the economics. Mukoma, let's bring you in here. Why did you choose crime fiction over other genres? Well, it, for the same, some of the same reasons that uh, Ian just mentioned, you know, it allows you to bring in the big questions. Um, for example, in Kenya some time back, you couldn't dream of the president's death. It was illegal to dream of Kenyatta's death. You know, now, you know, how do you talk about that in a realist novel? You know, but, you, you know, you can bring all sorts of ridiculous, real, you know, real issues uh, in the novel, mm. in, in the detective novel. It lets you go in anywhere and everywhere. You, you can go anywhere, yeah. I mean, in, in my last novel, um, the characters start off in Kenya, you know, uh, it's set in the post electoral violence, you know, so they deal with that violence. They go to Mexico where they deal with drug dealers, then they go to the US, <laughs> you know, so you, know, you can, I think it's a very flexible, it's a very flexible genre. Let's talk about the audience then. You are Kenyan, you based in the United States. Who are you writing for? When I started writing, I was thinking of an African-American audience and an African audience. But what has happened is, you know, the, the genre is universal. So I found, you know, a lot of bloggers, you know, reading it. I think other, people, who other, people who others wouldn't be reading African literature, reading it. Um, tourists who come into Kenya. You know, so it, it, it's interesting in, the, in that it has gone beyond... Uh, my hopes for it, you know, There's for, for the writing. There's a global or universal appeal. There's a universal appeal, and I think it's, 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 you know, suddenly there are the local issues, you know, for, let's say, a Kenyan uh, or for an African-American questions of race and identity. But there are also these questions also for, for people outside of that are universal. It's a, it's a universal struggle to try and find your place in the world. 
And Shamini, let's talk about you then and your work. Is it a break for, from Malaysian literary tradition? It, it is a break because I very consciously decided to write crime and I decided to write crime because I wanted to write about contemporary Asia because what I found was that most of the literature coming out of Asia, India, um, was always the grand historical novel. And it always had people whose lives were determined by fate. You know, they were born, a soothsayer would come along and say, oh, things are going to be bad for you, kid. And, the, and it was that sort of novel. And it was so un-Asian because Asians are the least likely people to be thinking about history because we are very forward-looking as a people. We're the least likely to not have self-will. And yet these books are always about people who don't seem to be in control of their own fate. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I was tired of stories of stoic grandmothers and things of that nature. My grandmother was not in the least stoic, so I didn't believe them for a second. And so I was looking for a vehicle to talk about contemporary Asia. Um, so at first I put a whole group of people in a room and I hoped that they would just start a conversation, but they didn't. Um, apparently I wasn't good enough a writer. So then I killed someone. And next thing you know, it was a catalyst for a conversation about Asia, about politics, about culture, about anything, really. Well, was it not frightening, though, a big challenge to step out of what is perceived to be an authentic Malaysian story and delve into that? Well, like Ian, I made sure that I was married to a breadwinner, which gave me that sort of freedom to perhaps experiment. But I am one of those people who don't think about the consequences of what I do. So I'll have an idea, and next thing you know, I'd have finished the book. Fun. And it's very dangerous and it's a very bad habit. Um, you I know. think it's fantastic to be like that. But, but again, were you surprised at how well your Inspector Singh uh, books were doing? I mean, it's a very odd thing to say, but writing genre is actually more groundbreaking than writing the great Malaysian or great Asian novels. And I think I'm one of the few Asian authors who've been given an opportunity by Western publishers to do that. So I said to my publisher recently, because she was talking about this fantastic book that had just come out of Asia and the story, I said to her, if you take that plot and move it to London or to Edinburgh, you'd have fallen apart laughing. So why does it become credible just because it's from the exotic East? You know, I just want people to understand that we're not that weird. You know, we, we do things in a fairly normal way. We kill people for fairly normal reasons. As it happens in As any it part happens, of you the know, world. You annoy me, you call me fat, I kill you. You know, it's easy. It doesn't have to be about fate. <laughs> you, you're sounding very dangerous at the moment. But Ian, were you surprised by your success? Were you surprised at the way the world was receiving your characters? Well, I, I wrote for a very specific audience to begin with. I wrote for me. Um, I wanted to write the kind of book that wasn't being written that I would want to read. And I wanted to write about contemporary Edinburgh as a microcosm, perhaps, of Scotland. Um, I wanted to show readers there was more to Edinburgh than the castle and the bagpipes and the kilts. And um, I thought Edinburgh was a place that had certain specific social issues, social problems that I wanted to write about. And slowly, because the books weren't successful for a long time, but slowly I built an audience in the UK and beyond, who also seem to be interested in seeing this other side of life. Um, so was I surprised at the success? No, because for a long time I wasn't a success. And by the time it came, I was old enough to appreciate it. Mukoma, I can't resist this question. Your father is a celebrated author, a global icon really, and he argues that African writers must write in their native tongues. You've just explained who your audience is and it's really universal. Would you ever consider writing in your native language? Uh, and it's, it's something I think about quite a lot and one of the ways I've answered that question is thinking about translation. You know, so right now I'm involved in, a, in translation projects, whether, you know, taking Kane Prey stories, for example, winning stories and translating them into Kiswahili or Kikuyu. Uh, you know, but recently, actually, I was talking with my father and I said, well, I think I've made a decision. For starters, I won't be writing my poetry uh, in English. You know, so now I'm writing my poetry in Kikuyu. So I, I, I do believe that, that as a writer, I do have a duty. Even though I'm trying to reach a universal audience, I still have a duty to my language. I mean, what does it mean? Uh, you know, to be fluent, in, in, you know, and to carry these worlds in a, in a language that's not mine. Shouldn't I also enrich my own language? I mean, you know, right now I'm enriching the English language, you know, extending the, you know, the, the English literature, literature in English. I mean, shouldn't I do that, this, you know, for my language as well? So I do believe, I do believe I have, I have a duty. Uh, you know, to my language. I think a lot of African writers and perhaps other writers from other parts of the world feel that responsibility. But then what are we saying? Are local literary traditions under threat from Western narratives? 
Well, it's, it's very interesting because for musicians, uh, for politicians, and so on and so forth, you know, the language, there's never a question of, of the language they should use, you know. There's, and, and in a way, it's actually the musicians who have been uh, keeping the language alive. It's with the intellectuals, you know, who should be, you know, essentially still in fire, still in the knowledge. We're the ones who should be bringing that fire and, and feeding our languages. Shamini, what do you think about that? Uh, I'm, I'm ethnically part Indian and part Sri Lankan, but I'm third generation Malaysian. My parents spoke different Indian dialects, so I learned neither. As a consequence, I only speak English and Malay, which is the language that we are taught in school in Malaysia. So I've lost the opportunity to actually express my thoughts in one of my mother or father tongues. Having said that, I do feel an obligation to, if you like, rescue um, Asian writing from the expectations of a Western audience. I do feel obliged to talk about um, the world I'm living in as it is. You know, and uh, you know, talking about you know, the global south and us not always thinking in terms of the West, I mean, we should also be translating each other. I mean, you know, I should take Shamini's works and translate them into Kiswahili or Ian's yes. works and translate them into Kikuyu. And that way then, we are also bringing other cultures and other knowledges uh, into, into African languages. Mm. I'm curious to know, how are critics responding to your work? I think the critics are way behind what's happening in African literature. Uh, you know, the critics are educated in, uh, in, in, in the Western aesthetic where they tend to view popular fiction as, uh, as, being, as coming from low culture, so they don't take it as seriously. Um, but yet, the African, the African literature field is changing. You have writers in the diaspora, you have people who are writing science fiction, uh, you have people who are writing detective fiction. So I'd say the critics themselves are way behind, you know. Ian, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. I mean, how are critics responding and how should they be uh, re responding to emerging Asian and African writers or literature? Well, one problem um, has always been that in the UK and in the US, we're very lazy, They're, you know, so that books weren't translated from other cultures. But that, with crime fiction especially, that mould got broken because of Scandinavian crime writers. So when the Scandinavian crime writers, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and Henning Mankell and Jo Nesbo, when their books started to sell in quantities translated into English, suddenly English language publishers were rushing around the world looking at which culture would be producing the next bestseller in crime fiction. There are all these other cultures out there who have things that are valuable that they should be saying and that we should be listening to. Um, so give us them, give us the books in translation and we will probably find an audience for you. And Shamini, you are Malaysian, you've written these books, the audience is speaking its own language by receiving the books. Are the critics saying the same thing? You know, it's very awkward to talk about critics because, of course, when you say the critics are not spending enough time analysing your books, they could turn around and say, well, maybe because it's because they're rubbish. And, you know, <laughs> so you're always a bit nervous going down that road. But I do think there's a lack of interest in genre fiction from mm -hmm. Global South writers, if you like. But as Ian says, that's changing slowly. I mean, one of the things that I find ironic is that the reason I'm published by, a, you know, an international publisher is because there was an appetite for exotic fiction. Mm -hmm. So they came with great excitement when they found my Inspector Singh who travels around Asia um, investigating crimes. Um, but of course, what's exotic to a Western audience is home to me. So I'm not writing exotic crime. I'm writing crime in my own backyard. But doesn't it have to do with how Africa or even Asia has been imagined perhaps in the minds of the Western critics in particular that they're looking for a specific story from Africa, a specific story from Asia, and the battle is to get out of the pigeonholing. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think there is a looming crisis in, uh, in, in, in how African literature is being received. You know, there, there's the expectation now from, 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 from Africans to you know, to portray Africa in a, in a good light, you know, to, to have us serve the tourism board. I mean, there's that expectation that we should be painting beautiful pictures of Africa. But my own thinking is, regardless of whether we are writing for our, you know, from our, an African audience or, or even going beyond audience, for me, what I'm interested in is exploring the contradictions uh, in contemporary Kenya and, and also contemporary United States. The contradictions are glaring. You'll have, uh, you know, a very wealthy estate and there'll be a wall and behind that wall, there'll be a slum. You've just described my country yes. as well. So. <laughs> you know, so, 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 so I'm interested in exploring that and you know, as opposed to then worrying about the sort of image I'm, I'm, I'm portraying to the outside world. Okay, I do want to talk about the writing itself and what actually happens in some of these books. Ian, I will be reading from your book, 
doors open. The open door was only yards away and beyond it lay the outside world, eerily unaffected by anything happening inside the abandoned snooker hall. Two thick-set men had slumped bloodily to the floor. Four more figures were seated on chairs, hands tied behind them, ankles bound. A fifth was wriggling like a snake towards the doorway, straining with the effort. His girlfriend was yelling encouragement as the man called hate stepped forward and slammed the door shut on all their hopes and dreams, hauling the chair and its occupant back to the original line. I'm going to kill you all, the man spat, face smeared with his own blood. Mike McKenzie didn't doubt him for a second. What else was someone called hate going to do? Ian, I got frightened just reading that, that part. How do you come up with all the bloody scenes and the gory details? Do you have to close your eyes and imagine the, the most fearful s scene or it just comes naturally to you? I'm afraid it just comes naturally. <laughs> That's <to> frightening. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that, that crime writers, you know, we get all the, all the kind of dark stuff inside our heads. Um, we channel it onto the page, which in fact means that when you meet us, we're very well-balanced, lovely individuals, very good humoured. <laughs> Um, but I, I do think that when you take me to any, any place in the world, I always seem to be finding myself at the kind of, you know, looking for the scary bits, looking for what it is about the society um, that we are fearful of, and should we be fearful of it? And one reason that crime fiction persists as a best-selling genre is because it deals with a very basic question, which is why, decade after decade, century after century, do we human beings continue to do bad things to each other? Mm. And how, how do you sleep with all the monsters that inhabit your writing universe? How do you sleep at night? Well, actually, I think I come from it uh, slightly differently because my books aren't that violent. I mean, again... You think so? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I mean, frankly, I, I'm always terrified that, you know, whoever my corpse is, whatever murder method I've chosen, might not have killed him. So for instance, when I had someone bludgeoned to death in my Singapore book, I used the word repeatedly to just make sure that the guy would be dead. You and know? then you say there's no violence. Because <laughs> I always feel bludgeoned repeatedly is a fairly safe option. But what I am actually usually trying to do is air uh, a, a social or legal or political issue that I care about and trying to sort of channel it into a crime novel, use it perhaps as a motive or a backdrop and make it part of my stories. Ian, let's talk about the character Rebus. He's among the most enjoyed characters. Uh, people love him. There's a global appeal. Why does he appeal to audiences? He's, he's a maverick. We, 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 we like our mavericks. We like people who break the rules. He's imperfect. He's fallible. He drinks a bit too much. He smokes. He's not in the best health. He's got questionable taste in music. It just happens to be my taste in music. <laughs> And Rebus's task is to try and, try and bring some order, um, to try and bring order to that chaos, the chaos of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And Shamina, you are a fan of Rebus. Why do you like him so much? Um, very much for what reasons Ian was saying, because he's an outsider, because he never quite fit in, because, because he can't get along with his bosses or his peers let alone the women in his life. Although I'm always a bit surprised by that, Ian. I'm sure I could get along with Inspector Rebus very well. I am fascinated by the broad appeal of the protagonists, regardless of race, uh, religion, culture, whatever. Are readers open-minded? Is, is that the reason that readers are open-minded or you as crime writers are just getting away with a lot? Um, I, 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 th I think it, 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 it's, it's hard to generalize, you know, because some readers will take what they want as well. They'll take what they need, you know. So somebody will read, let's say, you know, my novel, and they will take uh, Ishmael's um, walk in the tightrope of, of justice and injustice. Uh, others will read it for, for Africa, you know, if, if they the Western, they will read it to see that Africa that they expected to see anyway. Um, so, so I, I think, I, I would say as readers, myself included, I think we are open and close-minded as well. We take what we need. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we don't let the book challenge us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ian, you're nodding. What, what are your thoughts? Well, some readers come to crime fiction for the pleasure of the puzzle. Some come to crime fiction because it's a comfort blanket, because at the end, order has been restored, justice has been done. Um, that's the kind of classic English sense of the crime story, but I'm not 
so interested in that. I think real life is messy, real crime is messy, and the crime novel should be able to include that messiness. I like it when not every loose end has been explained at the end, or when justice hasn't quite been done. There's something still a bit blurred about the kind of justice that's been done. Let's talk about women. If the protagonists were female, would they have the same universal appeal? What do you think? Well, in terms of how people have responded, I have a very strong uh, female, you know, female, uh, now she's playing the role of, of equal detective actually in the second novel, you know, and I think people have responded, um, they have responded positive, positive, positively to her. What do you think of that, Shamila? Well, I do wonder why I didn't write a female protagonist. I mean, um, all along I wanted an Indian detective because I wanted to be able to tap into my own sort of family history. And in fact, all I have to do is go to a family wedding or funeral and I get dialogue for three books. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wanted someone who was physically iconic, you know, and obviously a Sikh with the turban. Um, you wouldn't sort of miss him in a, in a crowd. Uh, and historically, uh, Sikhs have often gone into the military or the police in Southeast Asia so that was another sort of element to, to the Singh character. I am very concerned with, if you like, modern crime fiction, because a lot of it seems to me to be all about the violence and often all about the violence towards women. And I wonder whether that's because it's written by, you know, men. Um, and I find that quite disturbing. It's not even crime fiction. It's just sort of violent porn. Ian, can crime fiction be used as a positive force, as a changing agent in our world? You can try and flag up social inequalities, social inequities. You can try and flag up that corporations. Um, you can deal with all these things. You can deal with politics and you can deal with social problems. Does it change the world? I mean, on an individual basis, when the reader reads those books, then maybe they start to question their own lives and how they feel about the injustices in the world? No, I completely agree. My Cambodia book is, is mm. about the sort of Cambodian genocide and the idea of doing a story around the war crimes tribunal was to explore the history but do it through individuals so that it would be more accessible to a reader and we can sort of understand what's in our past because sometimes the facts are too big. The horror is too big to... to to understand as an individual. And I think sometimes writing and crime writing allows you to sort of um, address that. So what does the future hold for all three of you? What's next? More? Well, my new book that's just coming out this week, I think, is set in China and it's called A Calamitous Chinese Killing. And one of the things about Asia is that truth is always stranger than fiction. And so I was struggling to come to terms with how to write about China because you know you have everything. You have adulterated baby milk, you have land grabs by corrupt politicians, you have, you know, workers committing suicide in Apple factories. I mean, where do you start? But luckily they had the whole Bojilai saga, which, you know, I just sort of nicked and put in my book. So Inspector Singh, much like Deng Xiaoping, goes to China to seek truth from facts. Mm -hmm. we'll go back. um, you know, I, I, I want to definitely continue with, uh, with, with Ishmael and with Yambo, uh, you know, and I think for them, their relationship is coming to, to they're coming to loggerheads, mm -hmm. you know, so hopefully they'll both survive the next book or maybe not, hopefully. you know, I'm hoping they will. You wish them so well, well yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we spoke about doors open, but you've got your latest novel, Standing in Another Man's Grave. How's the response been to this latest novel? The response has been overwhelming because after five years in retirement, I brought Rebus back. I found a way of bringing him back into the series. It was as though he'd been sitting in a little cell inside my head, and when I unlocked the door, he came bounding out. He was very happy to be back on the page, <laughs> very happy to be back in his Edinburgh, and readers seem to have shared that enthusiasm. Yeah, we are all delighted for that. Thank you very much. Ian Ranking, thank you very much for joining us. Mukoma Wationgo, and of course, Shamini Flint. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for, for having us. us. Yeah. Thanks to our guests and to you for joining us. Unfortunately, I won't see you for a little while as I'll be on maternity leave. But don't worry, my colleague from Al Jazeera will be hosting the show until I get back. So please do tune in to South to North next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>